Where do you go to get your bad news? Uh, you know, people have their different go-to sources, right? You got, you got CNN, you got USA Today, you got Fox News, you got the Wall Street Journal, you can get some bad news there. Um, BuzzFeed, um, that's, play, that's somewhere that you can get, uh, you know, all kinds of news from that. Um, and, and, you know, I think about it, there, that saying there's an app for that. Well, there is an app for that. I actually have an app that kind of consolidates all the bad news from everywhere and, and brings it to me, you know, at, to my doorstep every day. So I don't really even have to work that hard. It's just here's some bad news, you know, just scroll through and it's all there in one place. And, and you might say, well, I don't need any more bad news. I don't really, you know, I would delete that app. I don't want that because I kind of feel like no news is good news, right? Just, I don't want to hear anything. Um, but here's a question. Is no news good news? I don't know that it is because uh, when I think about that, uh, my coworkers or my family and friends, they, they can keep me up on all the bad news. I don't need uh, a newspaper or, you know, a more modern digital source for all that. I can, I can find out what's going wrong in the world or in someone else's world by just listening. And so when you think about it again, where do you go to get your bad news? I think we all have basically the same sources. See, we just go to some reporter, right? That's what reporters are. They're happy to keep unhappy news coming. And there are people who have, you know, kind of news feeds for happy news. I don't know if you know those where you can, you know, like good news, uh, daily happy thoughts or things like that, you know. And, and yet it's funny. You think about this. The death of one person will make the headlines but there is something like six, seven billion people still alive, but that didn't make the headlines, right? Seven billion people are still alive today. Uh, and it, that's good news, I think, most of them. Uh, you know, things like that, if a, if a plane or a train comes off the track, then that's news. But if a plane stays on the track uh, or, you know, makes, it, makes its landing or the, the train stays on the track, that's not news at all. So that's why sometimes people say no news is good news. If I don't hear anything, it's probably good, right? But the truth is I need to hear good news also. And I think about it, you know, our son, Stephen, he's out in California. And uh, when he was only 10 years old, he's like 23 now, I think. Uh, but when he was like 10 years old, he came to me one time and said, Hey, Dad, where do the news people come up with new bad news every day. Like, how do, how do they have new bad news every day? And I said, well, you know, truthfully, I'm glad that a 10-year-old still wonders where, the, where it all comes from because uh, he, he's not really asking that question anymore, right? I mean, you sometimes have to look a little more in-depth to find good news, to find something to celebrate. Where, and so I, I now turn the corner and ask you, where do you go for good news? Uh, again, we have uh, basic cable, right? We have one that uh, we have to get it. I don't know. I always laugh about these things because they have these bundles where it's cheaper to get the bundle than it is to get the unbundled. So I'm like, okay, all I want is internet. I don't need TV at all. And they're like, okay, well, that will be, you know, $99. And you're like, well, how, okay, how much is it with TV? $49. And you're like, Okay, uh, I, I'll take the special. Uh, that's good news. I'll, I'll, I can get all those channels. But there's like a thousand channels on basic cable, right? That's basic. A thousand. Something like that. And I, one day I kind of like went through a bunch of them. I'm like, there was seriously absolutely nothing at all. I mean, I, I'm like, nope, 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 nope. So I don't even turn it on. But here's a promise I hope I can make to you, which is if you ever need good news, you can come to Glass House. You want, you want good news? You can find it here. And, and here is some good news, which is we are going to embark on Mark. Okay, for 2018, we're going on a journey for a little while, and it won't take the whole year. Uh, I'll try and make it a little quicker than that. But this is going to be basically a, a good news thing. And so if you want good news and you want to know where to go to do it, what you have to do is you go on your mark, get set, go to Mark. Okay, that's, that's it. It's just, where do I find some good news? I could use some good news. Well, I can tell you one piece of good news. This is the shortest gospel, okay? So it's, it's summarized. It's the executive summary, which I always like. I always like, like, if someone goes, here's the book 
for this semester. And you go, yikes. Um, but what if a teacher goes, here's the book for this semester. You go, oh, wow. Um, that one probably only costs $400, uh, you know, versus the, the big one, which is a lot more. Um, so when you think about it, this is a Cliff's Notes, if you will, to the good news. It's like summarize it for me. Um, bottom line it for me. This is what it is. And so you might not find much good news elsewhere in your life. But again, I know you can find it in Mark. I know I can find it in Mark. And the truth is, if I'm being 100% transparent, there's a simple reason I picked this book. Because that's one little thing I get to do. I can pick whatever book I want, right? And there's out of the 66 books of the Bible, I'm like, you know, they're all pretty good. But I could use some good news. I, I could. I could use some good news. The other day at, at work, I told somebody who came in to talk to me. I, I was currently talking to someone who had bad news for me. And someone said, can I, I don't mean to interrupt, but can I talk with you for a minute? I said, is it good news? And they said, no. I said, I'm currently accepting only good news. And they said, well, can I come back tomorrow? I said, well, yeah, okay, we'll reset it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. But, you know, the, the quota is, it's full, you know, no, good news empty inbox, right? Any, anybody? Um, anybody have that, you know, but, but that's what I say, you know, if you come to Glass House over the next few months, you know, in or out, doesn't matter, but no matter where you drop into this story, no matter what else is going on elsewhere, I have no idea what'll go on out there, but I know this, you'll get good news here, because as you look at, at Mark, the full title of this book is The Gospel According to Mark. And, you know, I'm a music fan and I like gospel music. I really do. But there are people who think gospel is just one of the categories for the, for the music awards, right? Gospel, what does it mean? I don't know. It's church music, right? But, but what is it? Well, in Greek, it literally means good news. So it says, this is the good news according to Mark. Mark is a guy saying, hey, listen up. You know, extra, extra, read all about it is basically what he's doing. He's that guy standing on the corner saying, I have good news. Good news? Anybody need any good news? And people are like shuffling off on their way to bad news. And I don't have time for that. <laughs> but that's why, again, he has a very hard-hitting headline style of writing. I really like this. His book was written to people who were in a hurry. His book was written to people who said, uh, okay, give me the quick version. And that's what he did. Who was Mark? Why was he so happy? <laughs> right? What made Mark so happy? Was he living in trouble-free times? Well, if you know anything about history, you know he wasn't. These are troubled times, right, that we live in now. But, you know, rewind the tape and put yourself into first century, you know, Middle East culture and say, yeah, things were a lot easier there. Um, you look at a guy like Mark, he didn't have an easy time. He didn't have a trouble-free life. He was a companion of Paul and Peter. Uh, he went on mission trips. Uh, in fact, he kind of bailed out on one. That's kind of a bit of a spoiler too. But we'll see, this is a guy who had people like say, we don't want you anymore. You know, he had his share of difficulties. And so his, his, he actually had two names, John Mark, uh, that's how he's best known. But when you think about it, Mark, Mark didn't just live one life of, of, you know, good news every day. Just turn the page, good news, good news, good news. But he's a reporter and he's writing from Rome around 60 AD. This is toward the tail of his life that he's writing this. But he was a young man when all this stuff was happening. He was a guy who grew up in the midst of it. So he, he's a guy who's watching People get tossed out of their houses for some of these beliefs. He's watching, uh, you know, Jesus, it's, he, he's talked about a bunch of stuff. He's done a bunch of good stuff. He didn't know the end of the story, right, while he was living. I think this is really important. Um, I don't know if you were writing your life story. If you'd say, oh, man, it's all good news, all good news. Every chapter, yay, every happy chapter, every page, every wonderful thing. But here's Mark, who along the way was like, there were times where it looked like the Jesus thing was really going to take off, right? I mean, it was like, yes! And then, well, I don't want to give you away the whole thing, but there's a time where he's basically the first streaker that is ever in the Bible. Um, he he's makes a run for it because there, he's, he's in the midst of a mob and they yank 
the little bit of clothes that he has off as he's wrapped himself in a sheet and he's like gets away literally running naked and you go wow <laughs> what a life i can't wait to read this stuff this is in the bible yep Okay, so Mark's gospel kind of reads like headline news. I think that's important to know. Out of breath, kind of breaking news coverage. <laughs> Here's the Jesus story. And I love that because not a lot of detail. If you're a person who says, give me more detail. I need more detail on this. Like, what exactly did the demon-possessed man look like and say and all this stuff? You go, well, look in Luke or look in John or look in Matthew. Uh, that, there's a lot of detail there. But Mark, no, Mark... He's hitting the highlights. And so he doesn't spend a lot of time on dialogue. That's one thing that you'll see. What makes this book unique, it doesn't talk a lot about what Jesus talked a lot about. What it does is it, it focuses on the works of Jesus more than the words of Jesus, which I think is kind of cool. Because to me, this is really significant. Because frankly, I'm a little tired of hearing people talk about what they believe. I mean, especially these days. It's like, wah, 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 wah. And maybe I'm guilty of it too. But there's times where I'm like, could you just show me what you believe? Could you show me and just do what you're always saying you do? Oh, well, I really believe in, you know, equality of, of people and treating people with respect. And, you know, God loves everyone and I hate everyone, you know. But then when they actually live it out, you go, that doesn't look anything like your talk. Your talk is beautiful, but... I don't know, show me. See, I always think about, uh, at least in school for me, I always liked lab. I, like, I loved lab because the, the teacher would blab, 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 and then you'd go, lab. You know, they'd talk about two chemicals and what they would do and stuff, and I, my eyes are just completely glazed over. And then they'd go, and we're going to mix two chemicals and watch them blow up today. And I'm like, yeah! Yes! You know, this is my, I will definitely be there for that day. You know, boom, I can remember those things so much better than blah, blah, blah. So this is a lab, okay? I like seeing people behave their beliefs. I like action. I love action movies. You know, they have a whole genre called action movie. Think about, what if there was a genre called inaction movie? Would, what happens in this movie? Absolutely nothing. It's people talking, you know, wow. Wow. Um, I just, I just like some action. And that's exactly what happens here. There, there's something changed. So again, as, as we're getting into this, I think about this and how it fits into today, which I think is a very important thing. Um, some people think this is a dusty old book and has nothing to do with anything. But to me, it has everything to do with right now. See, I hear marketing pitches every day. Do you hear those? Do you hear new and improved and brand new news and hey this is exciting and look over here and that we got something great um what i what i love to think is this is mark is not a marketer he's not a marketer he's not just giving you promises he's actually more of an operations guy if i could put it that way he he is somebody who had a mark made on his life that his life was so radically changed by the person of jesus that he's like Look, man, I, I can tell you as an eyewitness, this is what happened. I saw him do stuff. It's not just all the cool stuff he said or his logic. It is his life was worth looking at. And again, when I think about that, it's action-packed. It's snippets, it's scenes, it's rapid fire. If it was, a again, one of those um, camera things, I love um, modern, you know, modern movies like... I actually like vintage movies too, but you know, vintage movies didn't have the fast cuts, right? We've got sort of like these days a shorter attention span, they say. And so, you know, you watch a, an old movie that won all kinds of awards and sometimes it's like got three scenes, you know, and you're like, wow. Um, but today you're like, you know, shoulder mounted camera, guys running after things, there's all these cuts and you're like, <laughs> that's how Mark is for me. So again, if you have any trouble ever paying attention, I think, Mark, good news for you. Uh, we'll get through it very quickly. So that's what you see in this, and I'm calling it and titling it Old New News. And the reason I called it that is because it's not new news, right? I mean, in some ways, if you've been anywhere near a church, anywhere in your life, or you kind of grew up in the United States somewhere, you've probably heard this, but you got to remember that Mark 
to many of the people he was talking to, they had never heard this before. So what I'm trying to do and hoping to do in my own life too is just start with that kind of no news and, and think of what this would be to break this into my life for the first time. And so this is what it says in verse one, the beginning of the gospel, I love it, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And remember, gospel equals good news. And the beginning of the good news is of a person, right? There's a person on the scene. And so what I wrote down was this little thought here, which is the good news is God news, all right? It's old new news. It's not, it's not like breaking news, but for some people it might be, which is there is a God, right? This is, we're not just off in the middle of nowhere on, on a little dirt clod that accidentally happened and, and all the rest. And, and again, I, what I love about it is there's thinking people on both sides of that thought. I mean, there's people who think, no, there isn't a God. And there's people who think a lot and have amazing intellects and think, no, there's definitely a God. And so, you know, when you think about that, it's going to be a faith decision somebody makes on one way or another. Uh, there's enough bad news that you can go, well, if God is so good, why all the bad news and all that? I understand that. I've wrestled with that. I wrestled with that today, and I don't think I'll ever stop wrestling with it. But the good news where do I go to get it? Well, I don't know where to go to get it, but I know where I've gone to get it now, which is the scriptures. And see, when I think about this, it's, it's not just good news there. It's God news. It's, it's news about the Son of God. And some people would say, well, that's, that's like old news, right? But remember, to them it was not. And I hope to us it's not. So I want to freshen it up a little bit. This is the thought, that God has come to this earth personally right? As a person. Um, John 3.16, very well known. Maybe it'll even show up in the Super Bowl. People used to hold up things like that. You know, if you, if you don't know, there's a, a Super Bowl. About the only thing I care about the Super Bowl is that we have a Super Bowl of nacho cheese. Um, <laughs> that will be very important to me. Um, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, but that's an aside. So you see at the end of verse one, it says Jesus is the son of God. That's good news. Why is it good news? Because when you think about it, once you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. See, I, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen God. I don't know what he looks like. I don't know what he acts like. It, it's either good or bad news that there's a God. Because, see, if, there's, if God's there and he's mad, <laughs> I'm in serious trouble. Because if he was big enough to do all this, he's a lot bigger than I am. And if he was smart enough to figure all this stuff out, uh, I'm in serious trouble if he doesn't like me. Right? So I think about that. And... All throughout human history, people believed that there was supernatural stuff. But have you ever gone sometimes to things and not being disrespectful of other places? But um, it's scary. I mean, I've gone, to, I've tr had the privilege to travel the world, and I've gone oftentimes to places that are temples of other belief systems. And I'm like, that's that's one of your that's wow, that's that's out of my worst nightmare. I mean, that's a scary thing. I mean, this thing is like a beast and, and horrible and mad and you got to appease this god somehow you know and i'm like Ew. you know and there's millions of them and i just you know it's, it seems very troubling and so i think about that again on, on my life just to find out yes there's a god that's great but you know what what's he like well he's like jesus so if i've seen jesus i've seen him and what's he like um does he hate me no no he's in fact he can relate a lot to you. I mean, he's he's gone through stuff that you've gone through. He goes through things that you go through. Um, is it for the few, right? It's for the elite. It's for really smart people, or it's for really good people, or it's it's you know certain kinds of people. It says in John three sixteen, it's for whoever, whosoever. What does that mean? It means like, are you a whosoever? Yep. Well, so am I. And so whoever believes, it doesn't say whoever behaves, whoever gets everything right, whoever never messes up. It, it, it's like, it's, it's someone who believes, yes, there's a God, yes, he loves me, this is what he looks like, and I can learn from his life. I can look to his life. A, a life of hope now, a life with him forever. Okay, it's, it's kind of simple in some ways. And if the fact that God loved you enough to, to come here and walk the dusty earth, and not just sit in some aloof corner of something and go, oh, you all messed up. Let me throw a few lightning bolts your way. But the fact that he actually would walk through and experience the worst that this life has to offer, the very worst. He suffered more 
than I believe I ever will or ever could. And so the Bible says that God has suffered on behalf of his love, which is you. And if you think about that, I mean, if that's like, yeah, what else you got? You know, that, that's old news to me. I think to that and I go, wow, that's sad in my own life if I've heard it so many times that it no longer matters. But the good news is God news and that God came and sent himself. See, this is really important because there's some people who are confused on this and admittedly it's a difficult concept. But when, when we say that Jesus is the son of God, he's not the son of God in the sense that I just mentioned a little while back that we have a son named Stephen or I have two daughters here in the room, right? I mean, it's not like that because the, the Bible says that God is spirit, right? I mean, he, he's, not, he, the, the, he's not like a dad. God the Father's not like a dad, you know, in that true sense. But these are human language for us to understand things. God is, Jesus is God's son in, in, a, in a different way than Stephen is my son, right? There's one God, the Bible says, eternally existing in three persons, three manifestations, you know, Father, Son, Spirit. What does that mean? Well, it means there's a triunity to him. There's a unity to him. There's a otherness to him that I go, well, I, I don't know. He's like three things, three people, but one. There aren't three gods. There's God. And so when you hear that God sent his son, he sent himself. It's really important to think about that. I mean, uh, I don't value my son more than my daughters. I just think about this in terms of uh, my own child, if, if, if I were going to sacrifice something, I would sacrifice honestly, and I mean it with all my heart, myself before I would sacrifice them. If someone said, okay, I'm either going to shoot one of your three kids or I'm shooting you, I'd say, please, please let them go. You know, there isn't a parent who really understands parenting who wouldn't say the same. It'd say, well, if, if a surgeon had to take something out of me to give it to my kids, I, yes, sacrifice me to save them, right? And this is what you see God's heart toward this. This is really good news. Is God mad at us? Is God like the Greek gods, right, that so many of our, our modern day movies are made out of? You know, the, the hammer, the god of thunder and all this stuff. Is, is that God? Are they all up there fighting and we're like having rocks thrown at us because they're mad at each other? No. There is a God who made all of this, and the good news is he came to all of this and said, I'm with you, I'm for you, your family to me. See, and that to me is really good news. Um, he says it's the, the, the name of Jesus. Jesus means savior. You know, God could have said, I'm sending you, you know, whatever the name of judge is, but it isn't. His name, his name means God is salvation. Everyone needs salvation. <laughs> right when you think about that and so that's really good news to me I hope it's good news to you the good news is not new news <laughs> in any way um, but I love the fact that it's the be beginning of the good news what was the beginning of the bad news see and, and uh, it's funny I I know oftentimes people are debating um, whether these are allegories is it literal? Can it be taken figuratively? All of these types of things. I'm going back now to the beginning of the bad news. Where's the bad news begin? Well, it begins way back in Genesis, right? There's good news. God created and it was good and it was good and it was good and it was good. He keeps saying, it's good, man. This is good. Hey, this is good. And then you get to Genesis 3 and it says, woo, this is bad. What is it? It's when sin came in. And, you know, we could go on and on, and I won't because Mark was a, a person of few words, so I should be. Uh, but sin came in, and we can d theologically debate whether God should have done that or, or shouldn't have done that. But you know what? Freedom requires a choice, right? And if you only have one choice, you don't have freedom. So freedom, love, all of these things that I value deeply in my life required on some sense the capacity to make an opposite choice or a different choice or a rejecting choice of all that and so you have genesis 3 and you have adam and eve and all of this stuff and and you have a choice there and it's funny because it's it wasn't 
you have to eat this one tree and you can't eat anything else. Isn't it interesting that it was a single thing that he said, there's one thing in all of the world that I don't want you to do. And they stood under that tree and said, why not? Um, and, and you think about what human nature is. I don't know what your nature is, but I know what mine is. Mine is wet paint don't touch is I mean, that isn't wet. Well, it's not that wet. And I can still get my name in it, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, if they put a sign over here at Davidson that says, we're working on the lawn, please don't cross it. And there's a sign out in the middle. I'll tell my wife, hold on, I can't read that sign. I'll go out there and walk across the thing and cut the path. I'm like, you know, it's just, it's just part of who we are, right? And so you see this situation and it's a sad situation because talk about bad news. I mean, right away you have the very first murder. You know, if they're reading the, the uh, you know, Garden of Eden Gazette, you know, there it's like um, Cain kills Abel, you know, first family. And you're like, yikes, there's only two kids in the whole world and one of them killed the other one? Man, what a mess. And so what's interesting is right in that same spot, there's something that scholars call the first gospel. It's, you know, it, it basically means that right in the midst of that bad news, it says the serpent has come and destroyed it. But guess what? I'm sending a savior that will destroy the serpent all the way back in Genesis. So you have this long time and you have the entire Jewish culture, which I respect deeply. And you read through their Old Testament scripture. This is not this New Testament. It's not new news. It's not like it came out of nowhere. Who made this stuff up all the way along? There was this promise. Yep, you can look around and see the sin, but I can tell you, look up and see the sun. You're about to see God do something. God himself will come and visit this place, and he will be sinless. Sinless. And this guy's going to do some stuff. Now, when I think about it, this is where we get to verse 2. Don't worry, I am going to step on the gas. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 2. It says, as it is written in the prophets, right? It's not new news. It came from somewhere. It's written in the prophets. Did you know, um, you know, there's people who get obsessive and weird on this stuff, and I try not, and I'm, I'm at least obsessive, but I try not to be weird. Um, when you get to the prophets, I mean, I, I didn't always know the Old Testament, and I'd heard there's a lot of stuff in there that's predictive. Well, guess what? I had a actually spiritual experience of coming to faith, but I didn't know many facts. And I'm my wife knows I'm the kind of person who later went back and just read everything I could find, every archaeological journal, everything to try to figure out, and is this just wishful thinking? Is this just some cool thing or religious belief? Or is there any underlying fact behind all this? And I can tell you that I exhausted myself, but also exhausted any need that I have to for any further proof. I know beyond a shadow of doubt in my life, that there were predictive things that said a guy's going to come, here's what he's going to be like, and that the statistical chances of that being fulfilled in actual history eh, is either 100% possible because it was God or 100% impossible because it could never happen. Um, so again, if, if you think about reading tomorrow's newspaper or next year's newspaper or 10 years from now's newspaper and getting it right, well, we all think that I can read yesterday's newspaper and predict yesterday's headlines, but I don't know how to predict tomorrow's headlines. And yet throughout the scriptures, you have this prediction of all these little fascinating, sometimes weird mathematical things that say, this guy's coming and he's going to do something. And even the Jews themselves were like, this is a very difficult puzzle. We don't understand it. And along comes Mark now in Mark chapter one going, we figured out the puzzle. We solved the Rubik's cube. God was saying, I'm coming and this is what I'm going to look like. And this is where I'm going to come. And this is what's going to happen. And he says, only in retrospect, have we now figured out that was the guy that God came. God came. He did just what he said he would do. And so again, this is not new news. There were predictions where Jesus would be born, Bethlehem, when Jesus would be born. Uh, there's a mathematical formula in the book of Daniel that tells you when he will arrive. It's pretty interesting. And these are things that have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were sealed up that everyone's like, oh, we're going to open them up and they're going to disprove the Bible. And then they went, whoops. Went, wow, these were before, these are dated back, carbon dated before Jesus even walked on the scene. And yet, hmm. I, th I wonder if Jesus actually did come. See, what would his life look like? It'd be good news, man. It'd be good news if God came and he, uh, he actually liked me. 
<laughs> right? I mean, that, that would be pretty good news. And part of the good news is bad news, right? He died. He, he sin, sin got him pretty good. So the prophets had predicted, and this is a, a human nature. Again, I'm trying to, to shortcut this book as much as I can so we really get a feel for it. But the prophets had predicted there would be a messenger that would come right before the Messiah also. You know, and that turns out to be John the Baptist. It's what we're going to see in chapter 1 here. But I said, what's going to happen is there's going to be a guy who comes, and he's going to say, there's a guy coming. And you go, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and here's what he's going to be like, right? He, the guy who's coming first is going to look like this, and then Jesus is going to come, and you'll know you can, you can get ready for it. And there had been centuries and centuries of silence. If you didn't know this, uh, the blank page between Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, is about 400 years on the calendar. So 400 years went by and everyone's like, any good news lately? Nope. Malachi ends with terrible news, which is, you know, the uh, judgment's going to come and, and human history's going to grind and things are going to be really rough. But it's like... But into that darkness will come a light, which will change everything. And so I think about this, again, centuries of science. Anyone hear any good news? No news is good news. Well, it wasn't for them. No news for 400 years from God. Anyone heard from God? Nope. And so there was plenty of bad news going on, but where would they go for their good news? Well, uh, read the scriptures. And what do they say? Well, they say, uh, a Savior's coming. But what's interesting, this is, again, human nature. What did they do? They only paid attention to the good news. Because all throughout, it predicted that the Savior would come, but the Savior would suffer, right? So they had this idea, king's coming, and you know what kings do? They overthrow oppressors. So, you know, they're all worried about they're under the iron fist of Rome, right? They're, like, getting ground up by Rome. And it's no fun to be, you know, a, a nation that is, is oppressed by another nation. And so they're just like under the thumb, again, of Rome. And they keep saying, the Savior, that we've done the predictions. We know it's any moment now he's going to come. And they're waiting for this good news. But they missed part of the news, which is, hey, it's actually better news than you thought. But they didn't like the idea that king will, will be cut off. That king uh, that comes, that king of the Jews, he'll be cut off. He'll be beaten. He'll be trashed. He'll be thrown aside. And you go, how did they miss it? Well, same way we do. And like, I, I don't want to hear that. I just want to hear the part where I like what I hear, right? And so you see, it says here in verse 2, I'm reading it for you and with you. It says, as it's written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So this is a different John. Okay, I, I said it was John Mark who wrote this. So he goes by his middle name, Mark. But... Um, John, this John here is John the Baptist. And John's message is prepare the way of the Lord, make his way straight. And see, in those days, if a king came physically, like let's say that we had some famous person coming here, right? Uh, whoever they might be. Let's say Beyonce and Jay-Z are coming, right? <laughs> to Davidson. Um, what are we going to do? We're going to brighten up the place a little bit, right? There might be some people out painting or the, the green out there. If they're going to play at the green, right? You go like, woo, we got to do a little upgrade, right? We got to make it a little nicer than this. This isn't really ready for uh, my queen, right? And so um, so when you think about it, that's, that's what it was. And I think about it even back to my college days. We had something called Parents Weekend. I don't know if anyone's ever been involved with Parents Weekend, but for us, we actually looked forward to it a ton because the school would do everything right for a week, right? For a week, you got the best food ever, right? Uh, it, it, they just, they seriously at my college brought in plants uh, that they put all along the walkways and everything. And, and my parents would come and they go, this place is amazing. The surf and turf here is unparalleled. And I'm like, uh, it's more turf most of the time. Um, but but uh, what do you mean lobster? We don't, we don't get this on normal days. This is parents weekend food, right? This is not the normal meal. We'll probably still be leaving, eating the leftovers months from now. But this is the good news that he had is he said, good news, the king is coming. Good news, the king is coming. That's, that's all John kind of his whole world was. Man, I'm the warm-up act, and things are about to get good. Things are about to become 
God is coming. Now, again, when you think about that, that could be good news to some people. It could be bad news to others. It all depends. It depends on how ready somebody is. Like Parents Weekend, is it good? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, might do a little work on the dorm room uh, before mom and dad come too. Yeah, I, I had a record. This is really gross, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you it anyway, which is I made it through my entire um, freshman year, the first semester, uh, without ever changing our, the sheets to my bed. Um, and, it, and I actually took them home at Christmas break, <laughs> where I believe they were burned in effigy in the backyard. Uh, but but <laughs> but I, I thought about that. It was like I was actually going for the record. Um, I was going to try and make it through the whole freshman year, but my mom wouldn't let me. So um, you think about this. These are not good ideas. You know, these are not good ideas. These are things that might need to change. And so here's what makes it ready. This is the news. Again, this is, this is the news. I wrote it down this way. We can choose the news. What's meant by that? Well, just this simple thought. The news that the king's coming is either good or bad, right? Depends on how you're related to him, right? If he's coming to judge you, I guess that's not good. If the king is coming to destroy everything, uh, you know, Game of Thrones style, I, you go, well, I don't know if it's good that the king's coming. Is he my king or not? Um, and so when you think about this, you can choose the news. The good news is you can choose the news. You, you just decide which side you want to be on, right? And it all depends, because for Mark, this was great news. He's like, this is amazing news. The king is coming. This is good. We're under new management. <laughs> we can stop being ruled by all the things that rule our lives, and we can repent. See, I think about this. Repent is one of those words that's used in this chapter several times. And some people think it's a terrible word. I like to think of it like a reset button. I think reset's the most amazing thing ever. Just this morning, I had to reset some server thing that we have at our house, you know, and it was like there's this little button on the back that you put a paperclip in, boop, reset. Nothing was working, and I pushed the little button, and ah, reset. Now, what if I had looked up online and said, how do you reset this router? You can't. <laughs> you know, once it's broken, it's broken. You go, well, that's not good news. Um, so... The bad news is some things get broken, right? But the good news is there's a reset button. There's a reset button. And the reset button is what he's saying here. He's saying you can reset your whole view of what life is and what it isn't, how God is and how he isn't, what the meaning of your life is. And I think about this. If a doctor said to me, hey, you have you know, the, the proverbial good news, bad news jokes, you know, you have a fatal disease and you go, oh, that's bad news. Um, but if they say, good news, you're in remission. We actually have a cure. You're, you're, you can go on and live a, a healthy life. In fact, a better life than you had before you had this disease. In fact, once we uh, take care of this, you're actually going to be stronger, smarter, and better and happier overall. And you go, well, Wow, this is the best thing that ever happened to me, right? Uh, and so you think about this, repentance, it talks about the remission of sin. And remission just means removal, the removal of sin. And so that, to me, is incredibly good news. Some people get hung up on the bad news that there's sin, but, I mean, come on, where do you get your good, your good and bad news? Uh, is it breaking news to anyone that there's sin in the world? Is, is it breaking news to anyone that... Uh, that uh, Humans might have some good mixed in with bad, and there's some, some rough things going on that need to change. See, I think about this, to understand how good the good news is, I think we have to come into some contact with how bad the bad news is. And sin, as the Bible presents it, is a fatal disease that all humans have, right? Everyone has them. Everyone has it. Life causes death, right? <laughs> Left untreated, sin will steal, will kill, destroy everything God wants to do in my life. So when I think about that, sometimes I think that people have the idea that sin was just arbitrarily decided on. That God's sitting there in all eternity going, well, let's see. Should we, should, let's, make, let's call this sin. Yeah, well, let's make this sin. It, look, it's, it's not, it's not bad because it's sin. It's sin because it's bad. It has a degenerative effect, right? Left untreated, you know, bitterness. Oh, why did God decide that bitterness is a sin that he says in the Bible, don't let bitter roots grow? Because you go, because bitter doesn't make you better. There's nothing, whoever 
found the meaning of life by growing increasingly bitter and more and more envious and angry at other people. He says, uh, these weren't just arbitrary columns. Oh, uh, yeah, let's put, let's put joy in the sin column and, uh, and anger in the, right? I mean, there's, there's some logic to it. It makes some sense. And so it's a disease everyone has, and weirdly enough, sometimes we end up gravitating toward the depravity, right? And so sin's fatal, but Jesus can save us from that fatal thing. And I think that finds, you know, that simple thought, it's not new news. It might be old news. And again, I teach at a Christian school, which means sometimes I tell the kids, this is the most dangerous place you can be. Because if you hear this so often and go, oh, well, yeah, there's a God and he loved me enough to die for me. And yep. What else? What's for lunch? Uh, what's the, tell me a new joke. You know, don't give me the old jokes or whatever. I go, wow, that's, that's sad because this is world-changing, life-changing news. I mean, I, I can't even begin to explain unless somebody really understands history what the breaking through of the pure Christian gospel means to a place. Now, again, can it get polluted to such a way that it becomes bad news? Absolutely. Have you ever received bad news Christianity? bad, 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 here's who you're all wrong, and here's why God's mad at you. And I've, I've been on the receiving end of that where I'm like, man, this is called the gospel according to Mark. This isn't like the bad news according to Mark. The bad news, you can get it anywhere. The good news, you can get it here. So anyone who's bringing the gospel as if it was horrible news might be missing a little something. But see, I think about this. Uh, physical example with some some understanding out of my own life a few years ago and it's happened now several times to me actually um i let's call sun the you know the sun exposure sin exposure right when i was a kid i was having a great time in the sun oh man did i have a great time in the sun um I'd go skiing in the sun, skateboarding in the sun, ride my bike. I just never thought much about it. Bad news is I have no skin pigment. So, um, you know, I was out there not really thinking about it. And sometimes my parents would say things like cover up or whatever. I'm not, not cool. And, and so I would just go do my thing. And I didn't really pay too much of a price for it. Over the, it sometimes I wasn't very appealing because I was peeling. Uh, but, you know, I, I just a little sunburn here. No big deal. Now. Fast forward the tape. I'm old now, right? And so I go into the doctor, and they're like, hey, uh, you had a lot of fun, didn't you? <laughs> In the sun. I'm like, yeah, I had a lot of fun. They said, well, this isn't going to be as fun. You have um, some skin cancers, and they're of specific type that are more than just cosmetic. There's some that go deeper into your dermis. And by the way, they're close to lymph nodes. And by the way, um, if you don't get them out now... Um, that'll be it. You know, it could really spread. And I said, oh, <laughs> how about that? And they said, yeah, this usually doesn't show up till people maybe in their 60s and 70s, but you're an overachiever. And I said, yeah, I did have a lot of fun. <laughs> so um, anyway, all this to say, I I'm like, okay, so tell me more. And th there's something called Mohs surgery. Okay, all right. So Mohs sur surgery, M-O-H-S, um, is a thing where they can cut and scoop and get out the stuff, right? So um, uh, I always tell kids I have a I was hit by a bullet, but it, it's not it's not a bullet. It's I've got scars in different places. But um, this is what they told me: you can live cancer free. This can be in remission, and we can take care of it. It's going to be painful. You're going to look terrible before you look better. Uh, but this is what it's going to be. It's going to cost money. It's going to do all this. Okay. Now I could have said you're a terrible doctor. I don't, I don't come here to hear this kind of bad news. I come here to hear good news. I'm going to go somewhere where they tell me, you look beautiful, darling. Um, you know, that's all I want to know. You look fabulous. Or whatever. And I'm like, okay, cool. But what I did say is, wow, oh, this is a good doctor. You know, and they had great reviews and everything else. But here's the point that I'm trying to make, which is if I hadn't heard the bad news first, I wouldn't have received the good news with nearly as much excitement. Like if I'd just gone in, they said, here's the thing. We're going to cut the tip of your nose off, but don't worry. We're going to graft in some skin from the back of your neck. And I'm like, why? Oh, just because. Uh, it's just what we do. Um, you know, we're kind of not, we're having, I need a new car. And, and I'd be like, no. 
But all, as soon as the, we're going to show you the x-rays, you're aware of it. You said, yeah, I'm having trouble with these things. I don't understand what they are. He says, let me show you the x-rays. Let me get the second opinion, all this stuff. And when, as soon as I, it was verified with fact that there was bad news, I was so thankful there was some good news that I could come out of that place and say, what? You mean um, I can have Mo's and I can keep my nose? Uh, that's awesome. Um, what else? You know, I, I'm going to listen to everything this person has to say. I actually look forward to going to him because last time I went to the dermatologist, he said, we've gotten out in front of it. This is good, man. He said, we don't want you growing any more of those things that you grew when you weren't coming here. You, you, you're just ignoring it for a long time. But he said, now we can stay on top of this. He said, believe me. You know, you, you have a, a normal lifespan expectation, at least from this. So I think about that again. What is it? It, it? I can choose the news. I could have said, I don't like to hear that kind of negativity and gone home. I can't choose the reality, but I can choose the way I listen to different things. And so, you know, repentance is certainly is just simply a reset. And, you know, when I think about that, that's great news to me that I can reset rather than regret. I can reset. And if God comes and says to something in my life, hey, this isn't working for you, is it? Um, no, it's, it's really not. And so I love the fact that John is baptizing. This is what it says here, one of the things he does. While John the Baptist goes out here, this is what Mark's gospel tells us, is that he was out in the wilderness baptizing people. I hope they had sunscreen on. But this is what it says, uh, that the that Jews were coming out to see him. Now, you think about that. That's interesting. Again, um, Jews were coming out to be baptized in the Jordan River. Why is that important? Well, here's why it's important. In that day, to be water baptized was one of the ways that a non-Jew could enter the Jewish family, the Jewish culture. So this was something that was for everyone else. I don't know if you've noticed this, but oftentimes we think this is great news for someone else, right? Uh, So-and-so really ought to hear this. And this is, had become the pervading culture at the time, which is the, God's people who had God's word and had all these prophets and predictions and everything had gotten to the point where they were so arrogant that they, whenever they heard that there was sin in the world, they're like, yeah, those sinners out there, they're terrible. But they weren't thinking this sin that's in here is terrible. They weren't thinking that way. They were always looking down on someone else. And again, I don't know uh, what brands of faith you've encountered, but I know it's never good news to me when someone thinks they're right and I'm wrong. They think they've got it all figured out and I think I'm a disaster. You know, they're in good with God, but I'm in bad with God, you know, and all that. But that was the entire pervading idea there. And so... John the Baptist was out in the wilderness saying, we all need to change. We, all of us. And let's start with us. I mean, it, to me, it's great news when, when somebody says, this is working for me. You might want to try it. Um, like, there's a guy that I know uh, who, who radically changed his health. If you were to go back and look at his uh, his just overall numbers and everything about him a few years ago, totally different today, hardly recognizable. Well, this guy is a walking billboard for people saying like, hey, what, what is that? Um, they're asking him. He's not going around telling everyone, you need to get right, you need to get right. He's just walking around. And people are like, who knew him and know him or see a before and after are like, <laughs> I'll have what he's having. How do, I, how do I do this? And this is what was happening is that there was something happening where people were beginning to say, I need to change. Because it's really easy for me to look at you and say, you need to change. You need to change. You've got some things to work on. But for me to say, I need to change, I've got things to work on. I can't tell you how rare it is for me for kids to come at the school and say, I did something wrong today. I get it all the time. He did this, and he pushed me, and they kicked me. That's the teachers talking. And, and you go, wait, 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 wait. Uh, when's the last time a kid just voluntarily walked into my office and said, I have been a complete jerk all day. I have, you know, pushed everyone's buttons and blah, blah, blah. No, it's always, they, they did this to me. And you go, wow, I wonder what 
you did to them all day long before they did that, you know? And again, it's a very complex environment, but you look at these things and it's very easy to find fault with others. So this was people finding fault with themselves. I think it's great. And it's very cool because the Jordan River had such historical significance for him. This was the dividing line between the promised land and the non-promised land. You know, if you know anything about Old Testament history, you know that they were slaves in Egypt, right? It's all a big picture. It really did happen, but it, it's, it's this amazing uh, spiritual application, too. They, they were in a land of slavery and pain and everything else. God promises them a promised land, but they have to go on this journey. And because of doubt, they get a drought and they end up just stuck in this wanderness, <laughs> wanderness, wilderness wandering. I made up a word. And they're, they're all like there. But, but it's belief. It's trust. It's believing that God has something better for them that takes them over into this promised land, this promised life, right? And so that whole metaphor is huge throughout the Old Testament. And here you have him going back and they're going to the other side of it. They're going back to the Jordan. They're going back to the beginning. Where they're like, you know what? We need to reset. We need to just stop with all of this thing where we think the Gentile world is terrible and the Jewish world has got it right and you know we're mad at everyone else. We've got to just change. And this is what was happening. It was old news, but it was good news, and it was new news to them. See, I think about this again. People were really tired of religion. I don't know about you, but I think I'm the most tired that anyone could possibly be of religion. I find religion extremely tiresome when people um, you know, use it for what it wasn't used for, what it's not meant for. I'm really tired of legalism. I'm tired of people's talk. I'm tired of people who talk like they care about people and every action that they do shows the opposite. And so they, but I'm also sick of things in my own life where I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of talking about getting better. I need to get better. There's things that need to be changed. I'm tired of, you know, finding so easily finding what's wrong out there and so easily forgetting what's wrong in here. So it's breaking news to a lot of people that, you know, was happening out there. Why would someone go all the way out into the wilderness to hear the same old stuff, which was repent? You don't think they could have heard it in the temple? Of course they could have. But... John the Baptist was refreshing somehow, and I love when people are refreshing. When there's somebody who's so different that, you know, this is what it says, John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Maybe they just went out to say, hey, have you seen the dude who's eating like the honey locusts? <laughs> He's like, something weird's going on out there, man. Let's take a field trip. And they did, but I think there was just something authentic and real about him that he was he was saying the same old news they could have gotten in an easier way somewhere else but somehow there was something about it that said no the the king really is coming this time because this is what he's saying there's one that comes after me verse 7 who's stronger than i am whose sandal strap i'm not worthy to stoop down and loose i indeed baptize you with water but he'll baptize you with the holy spirit this is one of those things that, you know, people can get really weird on the interpretation of this passage. I think it is, kind of speaks for itself if you really think about it. What he's saying is, I could do something physical for you, but there's someone coming who can do something spiritual for you. I can do something external for you, right? I can give, have you go through a, a ceremony that even has some significance. We were discussing the other day the significance of the water baptisms that we've been a part of as, as a family and and how significant those things are they are really significant and uh we used to in miami do them out in the ocean which was just incredible because you'd have people i i used to i these are, will always remain some of the most important times of my life i can't tell you what it is to have a person come out to the water of the ocean facing uh you know south beach and for them to come out there and they're just, you know, uh, I mean, not to over characterize it, but just I'm picturing a guy that specifically there's a guy who's just all tatted up and everything. Tough guy, man, very tough guy. And he came out in the water and he looked, he, I'd always ask the same question, why, you know, what brings you here? And he said, I've almost died on this beach so many times I can't tell you. He said, I've 
made so many mistakes I don't even know how to count them all and uh, I'm out here because I heard that you can start over and I can't think of anywhere better to do it than facing all that from here and washing all that away and I said well I'll, I'll, I'll keep you under an extra long time <laughs> you know uh, and, and you know just seeing people come uh, there were times when we had baptism services there of a 100 150 people and that you know that that sometimes seems like a world away to me but at the same time you realize there's different seasons of life but the humility of of this verse when John the Baptist says man I'm not I'm not really I'm not preaching me I'm preaching him you got to meet this Jesus and he said if I got to tie his shoe before he goes on stage I have done something amazing I mean that the humility that was so unique in him was great but he was very confident too he'd seen this and what baptism means it means immerse it means soak so to to be soaked in the in the spirit you know to, to it any one of us i think could imagine what it is to be immersed in sin or immersed in sadness or immersed in suffering or soaked in sorrow you know but to be soaked in the things of the spirit is what he's talking about here and that'll change a person. So he says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. We're almost done here. And he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit departing upon him, or descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. You know, the irony is, um, I forgot to turn off my notifications and... I just got bad news feed right there, you know, the, uh, about a train crash in South Carolina. So I think about those things, you know, bad news just comes in everywhere. I'm, I'm sitting here talking about this, but, you know, two people lost their life in that. And I don't mean to, you know, in any way take that out of context. But just thinking about that, it's like the, I know they did not get on that train thinking this is it for me. You know, this is my last day. So. I think about that, and the, the, the good news of eternal life is it's just so much more than just a, a theology or a theory. You know, he says, Jesus was baptized there, and he says, you're, you're my beloved son. I'm well pleased in you. And I don't know if my kids will remember this, and I don't mean to cheapen it in any way but, uh, by sharing it, but my kids have already given me opportunity to share things from their lives if it helps. Um, with when when our kids were baptized and I had the opportunity to do that service for each uh, of them and it, the, again that will remain one of the most important days of my life in so many ways but um, I was I was shared with them the same thought but in a different way which is this this passage right here Jesus hadn't done a single thing yet he hadn't done anything he just he hadn't done a miracle this is the beginning of the book right and he says, you're my beloved son, and you, I'm well pleased. And I was like, you know, a lot of times as we think, i got to do a bunch of stuff for God to love me. i got to get everything right for God to love me. And, uh, you know, right at the outset, he's saying, you're just, you're just my child, and I, I love you because of that, um, not because of what you've done. And so, you know, when you think about it, this is the heart of the gospel, the good news, which is people have debated back and forth, why did Jesus get baptized? Why did he get baptized? He didn't have any sin. He didn't have anything he needed to fix. But this is the gospel. I think to miss this is to miss the gospel. Um, because he, all throughout the scriptures, he did things not for him, but for us. This is a, an amazing moment, uh, just a ceremony. It's just a bath, if that's all it is. It doesn't save you. It, it, it's not like that. Jesus saves people. Water doesn't save people. But he says... I, I'm doing something which is giving you an opportunity to have something that hits the reset button in your life and says, I, and for God to hear God saying, you're my child and I love you. You know, I, I, I'm proud of you. Um, you know, I, I'm a guy who's not prone to over emotionalism, but um, times when my dad or my mom has said just in real genuine way, hey, we are so proud of you for what you've done. I'm like, a million I'm not proud of you go away from those simple things, you know. 
And in verse 12, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. This is, this is why I want to end this chapter here, because it's a long chapter, but we'll hit it in a half. He says, he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. See, I think about the good news is, Jesus is triumphant in the wilderness, right? We, we blew it in the, in the Garden of Eden, but he, he in the wilderness, he won that one. And it says, 14, 15, again, I'm going to give you these verses. John was put in prison. Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Repent and believe in the gospel. See, you have, you have Jesus being driven out in the wilderness. You have John the Baptist being put into prison. You go, how is this good news? He says, the good news is this. There's a different kingdom. See, if, this, if the kingdoms of this world are the only kingdoms there are, and this thing's a stinker. I mean, can I be that transparent? It's, it's, it's hard, man. You, you come to love somebody. They age. They, they, they you know... The grave does what the grave does. And you go, How, how's there any good news in any of this? It says, because there's a kingdom that's beyond all this. There's a king that came from another place beyond this. And he says, follow me. And just as real as I rose from the dead, you'll die, but you won't die. You'll have your end physically, but it won't be the end. And the people that you have loved and have loved you are not lost. And you think about those things and you say, man, repent and believe in that, which means that you can be put in prison. That's still good news. You can be driven off into the wilderness and it's still good news because Satan at his worst is still weaker than God at his weakest. I mean, here's, here's Jesus. It says he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was tired. He was about at the death's doorstep out in the wilderness. And he was being you know, beat up on by the wild beasts, but angels were there to take care of him. And I think about the history stories that have been full of bad news, where there's people who say, uh, I'll leave you with this quote from Cory Tim Boom. Cory Tim Boom was a Holocaust survivor, and she said, there's, there's no cave so dark and deep that God's love is not deeper still. You know, she'd been all the way to the end of as bad as people could treat people. She's like, guess what? God was there. And uh, there was good news even in that place. Even in that place. So I think about it and say, again, where do you go for your bad news? Well, you don't have to go anywhere. Uh, but I hope even if, if, if you don't make it here physically every week, which is, is perfectly fine, and I hope you know where to go. Um, you know, go, go to Mark and, and, and look at these things because uh, there is good news here all the time. 16 full chapters of it. So... Uh, the good news is I'm done for now. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity uh, for us to enjoy uh, some Bibles, some friends, uh, some bagels, coffee, and just a little bit of warmth inside. Uh, the world out there can be uh, pretty crazy sometimes, and I'm just thankful uh, that you have always provided for me a place of peace and people uh, who are committed to those things, hope, glory, uh, gentleness, kindness. Thank you for coming in and showing us the way we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.